So welcome to lesson six of the unit, the history of the kingdom of God. Uh, and uh, in this lesson, we will be looking at how the kingdom spread out from Jerusalem to the end of the earth. Um, <clears throat> let me pray and then we will start. Father, thank you so much for enabling us to um, understand that the kingdom has been established through the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of your son, Jesus, uh, who is now seated at your right hand to rule the universe in a kingdom that will never end. Thank you that we are part of that kingdom. We pray, Father God, as we look at to the way in which the gospel of the kingdom spread to the end of the world, uh, pray that we will also partake uh, in taking the gospel of the kingdom um, to the ends of the world so that we may recruit many people. In Jesus' name, amen. So the question to be answered from this lecture uh, and from this lesson is this. On what basis does the kingdom of God spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth? On what basis does the kingdom spread from the Jerusalem to the ends of the earth? And so I will be giving you the basic reasons, and there are many reasons here. I hope you'll be able to put them down together uh, when you come to uh, um, summarize the answer uh, to the question. The first thing is this, the kingdom spreads through the spirit-filled preaching um, about Jesus Christ. Remember Peter on the day of, of Pentecost? He was filled with the spirit, and they thought uh, people who were there in Jerusalem they thought that Peter and, and uh, his colleagues uh, were um, intoxicated with alcohol because they heard them speaking uh, in their own languages, uh, praising God early morning. And so Peter stood up, filled with the Spirit, and he proclaimed Jesus. You know, this is a good thing. This is a good thing to remember about the Spirit. When the Spirit filled the church or the preacher, they don't preach about the Spirit. They preach about Jesus. So Peter preached about Jesus, and at the end of his sermon, um, when he declared that, you know, the Spirit's been poured out because Jesus is now exalted, seated at the right hand of God, is ruling the universe as the King. He is the Lord of David, the Lord and Messiah. Uh, and, and when he proclaimed that in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 40 tells us this, and when they heard this, that is when the crowds that were gathered there heard the proclamation of Jesus Christ is now exalted to be Lord. He is the ruler of the kingdom of God. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the gospels, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children. And for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added. So 3,000 people, as a result of the spirit filled proclamation of Jesus, 3,000 people were added to the number of the church in Jerusalem. So, this is the way the kingdom grows through the spirit-filled preaching about Jesus. The next reason for the spread of the kingdom is through the worship of the early church. It's not only through the preaching of the apostles through the spirit-filled, but also just a simple worship of the church. Listen to this. This is uh, Acts chapter 2 and verses 42 to 47. Uh, they, that is the 3,000 together with the Apostles and the disciples, the 120 disciples who were there uh, on the upper, in the upper room waiting for the, um, the gift of the Holy Spirit, they together devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So those are the four main um, uh, you know, religious rituals, shall we say, that they began with. So the apostles' teaching, the New Testament, the fellowship, that is, they met together, the breaking of bread is both the Lord's Supper and then eating together and prayer. So that prayer was part of it. And then continues on in verse 33. Everything, everyone was filled with awe 
and, and uh, many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, raising God and enjoying the favor of all those. So they, they were just from house to house every day, and just meeting together in a temple, together meeting, breaking bread from house to house. They eat their food joyful, praising God. So that's just their normal worship. But as they worship, listen to what happened. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So just a godly worship, praising God, you know, loving the poor uh, and enjoying the fellowship together. Uh, you know, you know, when we love each other in church, it will draw people to God. Um, so not only through the worship of the early the tradition is that through the teaching of the apostles. Now, this is the um, uh, the apostles, of course, the 12 apostles to there in Jerusalem, but their teaching is now um, um, preserved for us in the New Testament. So just the New Testament, you read, uh, uh, you, you read a chapter with your family or you read a chapter every day with someone you just meet up to read the Bible. That's the teaching of the apostles. Through the teachings of the apostles, people were gathered into the church of God. This is this Acts chapter 3. And verses 12 to 16. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people. Remember, they, they were healing the man who was just uh, begging for money uh, at, the, at the entrance to the temple. And Peter and John, they healed men. You know, and people were, they were running towards them because they saw this great miracle. And so when Peter saw people running to them, he addressed the people and said, Fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though? We had made him walk by our own power of godliness. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, had glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer released to you. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this by faith in his name. Uh, by faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of you. And then he goes on uh, in chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, every day uh, in the temple. Uh, this is chapter 5, so just, just chapter 5, uh, verse 42. Every day in the temple and in various homes, they continue teaching. This is the apostles proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, and then chapter 6, verse 1, that's the, so that's the beginning of chapter 6, it says, In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, so as they continued to teach from homes, uh, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, remember there was no church building at the time, so the homes, uh, the home of Mary, uh, the mother of John Mark, John Mark is the author of the uh, Gospel of Mark, their home in Jerusalem was the meeting place for the church. There was a church in their house. So as, they, as the apostles continue to teach, the, disciples, the number of the disciples continues to increase. Next reason for the, um, for the spread of the kingdom and the increased number of people was through the signs and wonders done among the people through the hands of the apostles. So this is uh, something that is attributed to the apostles themselves. Uh, but I read that in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 from 6 to 16, uh, remember, no one dared to join them, uh, but the people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. See, remember the uh, many signs and wonders. This is uh, Acts 5, verse 12. Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's colony. No one else dared to join them, see? Sometimes, you know, God prevents un uh, unbelievers from joining uh, the reigns of the Christian. No one else dared to join them. But people spoke well of them. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. We need to pray that the Lord will add believers to our number, to the church, and not unbelievers. Well, if unbelievers are being brought in, that they will be unbelievers who 
are ready to believe. So this is what she, we should pray for. But through the signs and wonders of the apostles, many were being brought in, and 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 the and the, uh, and, and the Lord believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers. You see that it was added to the Lord, not the church, added to the Lord, because we really need to see people coming to the Lord, not coming to church. We want to see evangelism is, is, uh, is making people come to know Jesus. The next reason was through the ministry of daily distribution for the need. You know, there were two main ministries in Jerusalem of the apostles. The first ministry was the proclamation of the word. And the second ministry, every day, there was distribution for the need in the church in Jerusalem. Now, today, um, in the churches, uh, especially the Wesleyan church, it's sad to say that they do not care much about their need. In fact, what they do with their need, they oppress them, suppress them, and beg them for money for the missionale. It is very sad. Uh, you know, missionale is a very oppressive way of making money for uh, for the church. But anyway, see, the, the ministry, through the ministry of daily distribution of food, listen to what's, what is happening in Jerusalem. This is Acts chapter 6, verses 3 to 7. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. That is the duty of food distribution, daily food distribution. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man of full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicano, Demon, Parmenas, and Nicolas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. You see, just that, you know, that when, the, when the two ministries of the church continues together side by side, the ministry of distributing the word of God in prayer, that's the ministry of the apostles, and they chose seven uh, godly people. The leader was Stephen, the first martyr of the church, to conduct the daily distribution of, of food for the needy amongst the church when the two ministries go together it says the word of god spread and the disciples in jerusalem increased greatly in number and a large group of priests even the priests who were devoted to the old jewish religion they became christian they became obedient to the faith not only through the ministry of food distribution but also through the persecution of believers Listen to this. This is what happened after the persecution. The uh, you know after Stephen was martyred. Remember they stoned um, Stephen to death. And this is the beginning of chapter eight. It says this Saul, who later became Paul, agreed uh, with putting him to death. That is putting Stephen to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. I think the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, probably because of what Jesus told them to. But, and then continues on uh, in verse 2 of chapter 8. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men, women, and put them in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. See, very encouraging. Those who were scattered because of the persecution of the church in Jerusalem uh, due to Stephen's um, martyrdom, they went and on their way they preached the word. So, uh, you know, uh, persecution never destroys the church. What destroys the church of God is false teaching and false teachers. Teachers who come and they water down the gospel or they uh, twist the, the, uh, the Bible to mean something that it doesn't mean uh, and therefore introduce practices that are unpiblical, um, you know, practices like uh, you know, female preaching, female ministry, that sort of thing. Uh, when false teachers, um, you know, uh, invade the church, that's the uh, death knell. For the church. So that's why we need to pray that the Lord will protect our churches 
from false teachers. And so, so this is the persecution of believers. It, it leads to, to the continuation, um, you know, of uh, the proclamation of Jesus. The next reason was through the ministry of gifted evangelists like Philip. Now, all of us are charged with evangelism, but there are gifted evangelists in the church. And I take it that this is one of the gifts of the Spirit, a gifted evangelist who will be really good in speaking, will always be in their hearts, uh, you know, the desire to see people being saved. If you have that, that means you are a gifted evangelist. And Philip was a gifted evangelist. Philip was the assistant of Stephen. And those seven people that were chosen to be uh, responsible for the food, the daily food distribution of the church in Jerusalem. So here is what he said of Philip uh, in Acts chapter 8, uh, verses uh, 5 to 8. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said. As they listened and saw the signs he was performing, for unclean spirits crying out, loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed so there was great joy in that city so gospel bringing great joy to the city because you know satan unclean spirits satan is defeated uh just as jesus you know um and his and the 70 remember when he sent up the 70 he looked at the 10 Exactly the same thing happened. You, they proclaimed the kingdom of God, and Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And this is the same, brings joy. Gospel brings joy to a city when it proclaims the gospel of good news of Jesus. Not only through the, the ministry of gifted evangelists like Philip, but also through the heavenly ministry of the recent Jesus. You know, Jesus, even though he's seated at the right hand of God, he still ministered to call people to send them out with the masses of the gospel. How do you know that you're called? You have the desire in your heart to proclaim Jesus, to save people. You really, in your heart of hearts, you, you know that people are heading to hell because of sin, and you really want to rescue them from hell with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how God puts in your heart his calling. And if that's you, you're being called to the heavenly by the heavenly risen Jesus for ministry. And that's what he did to Paul. Saul, his name was Saul before he was called Paul. And this is Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 6. As during Damascus, this is persecute Christians. A light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the crown, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. See, he's calling Paul. Of course, you know, when he got in the city, he was told that he's going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, we, we must be thankful for the Apostle Paul. He is the apostle of us Gentiles. Uh, even though his teachings are being twisted by people, especially his teachings about um, uh, women not preaching in church uh, and women wearing head covering as in 1 Corinthians 11 they're twisted, they're rejected and they're refused but, you know, we must appreciate our apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles apostle Paul and, uh, and and show appreciation of him, we must be able to obey what he's um, uh, through the inspiration of God he's, he's set down in his letters for the church not only through the recent Jesus calling people like Paul and setting them, uh, you know, you know setting them out, sending them out with the gospel, but also through the, just the godliness of the church. This is what they said in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Spirit. It increased in numbers, you see. Just the church being at peace and strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. See, just the church growing spiritually. That the fact that the church grows spiritually leads to the Lord increasing its number. So, you know, rather than worrying about, you know, um, increasing our number numerically, we must be concerned about us growing in godliness. Uh, as the Church of God. Not only that, but also through the special apostolic ministry of people like Peter, 
so Peter was the apostle to the Gentile. Originally, he was set aside to take the gospel to the Gentiles before Paul was then uh, endowed with the responsibility to continue on the ministry to the Gentiles. But here is Peter <clears throat> in his ministry. Um, uh, as Peter was traveling from place to place, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found uh, a man, uh, Aeneas, this is Acts chapter 9, verses 32, 35, Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had, be, had been bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. So all who lived in Lydda uh, and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. They turned to the Lord because they saw special ministry of Peter through the apostle healing this man, and they turned to the Lord. And, and once again, um, Peter now is in the house of Cornelius, taking the Gentile, uh, take, taking the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time. And this is what we're told that happened as he proclaimed the gospel to them. Verse 46 of Acts chapter 10 uh, to 46 to 48. For they heard, they, they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. That is, Peter and his colleagues who came with him, the Jewish colleagues who came or accompanied him to the house of Cornelius, proclaiming the gospel, the Holy, the Holy Spirit came down on these Gentiles, the centurion, those who were gathering in the uh, in Cornelius' house. And for they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. And Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to stay for a few days. So the whole the people who gathered there were baptized and gathered into the kingdom of God just through the proclamation of the gospel. You know, spirit-filled proclamation of the gospel through Peter. You know, Peter is gone now, but he, he, that, that responsibility comes to us. So he was endowed by the Spirit. And he was just, if you go and look at uh, his message in Exodus 10, verses 34 to 43, it's just he, he was just telling the story of the gospel. Jesus, who came and God was with him and he, he died, rose again, and, and now for him, proclamation of forgiveness of sins come to Gentiles and to the whole world. So through the special ministry of Peter pre preaching Jesus, preaching the gospel to Gentiles, but also through the direction of the Spirit. See, the, it was the Spirit who sent Peter to the house of Cornelius. So this is Peter. He was wondering. He, he saw a vision of God bringing down his huge, um, it's like a mat with all kinds of animal, uh, unclean, undefiled, uh, defiled animals, unclean animals that Peter had never eaten in his life. And uh, and, uh, and and three times he saw this vision. And, and then we're told in Acts chapter 10, verses 19 to 21, while Peter was thinking about a vision, Spirit uh, told him, three men are here looking for you. <clears throat> Get up. Go downstairs. And go with them. No doubt uh, at all. Because uh, I have sent them. See? The Holy Spirit sent people to Peter. Take Peter to go preach the gospel. You know, to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit. Here's the Spirit will open a way of the gospel. And will take us to, uh, take us to places uh, where, and give us opportunities to proclaim the gospel so that people can hear the great, the great news of the kingdom of God. Jesus is ruled uh, over the whole world. And then again, uh, through the Holy Spirit, see that the spread of the kingdom comes through the Holy Spirit calling Paul and Barnabas for mission to the Gentiles. Uh, and this is uh, this is Acts 11, uh, verses, um, sorry, um, Acts 11, verses uh, 25 to 26. And he went to Tarsus, that is Barnabas. Barnabas was from the church in Antioch, uh, in, in Antioch in Syria. And he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So now uh, the disciples are called um, so large numbers, gathered in the church in Antioch, and Paul and, and Barnabas taught them for a whole year, and they were called Christians there. Uh, but while they were there, uh, Acts 13, verses 2 to 3, as they were worshipping, 
at the Lord and fasting. This is the church in Antioch. As they were worshiping at the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them off. This is Acts 13, verses 2 to 4. So the Holy Spirit calls people um, to mission, uh, for mission. Now, a question was asked me um, by the Tongan class. So how do you know the Holy Spirit is calling you for mission? Well, of course, it's the same thing, right? If in your hearts, you know, God has put this concern that you really want to just save people, you really want to see how people is, uh, you know, can be saved through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then, you know, the Lord has called you. And you can do that locally. You can just start a little group in your local church where you can meet week by week, read the Bible together with them, uh, and, 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 and that's your mission. Uh, you can let people know, let your ministry, your minister know that you're meeting your little group, uh, reading the Bible, you can study the Bible together. There are so many um, uh, books in the bookstores about um, you know reading Bible studies, studying books of the Bible, questions for Bible discussion, that sort of thing. You can use those things. But you can also, um, you know, you can also train yourself for ordained ministry. And, you know, the difference is this. If you, if you do your ministry in local church, uh, effectiveness will just be limited to that. But if you become ordained, then your effectiveness is kind of wider. You know, you're wider. Uh, you, 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 you have opportunities to preach to people uh, in a sort of a wider context. So anyway, the Holy Spirit called Paul and Barnabas, send them off. Uh, in mission. The next reason was through the movements of people like um, Christian people like Priscilla and Aquila. So it was just a movement of people, Christian people who were concerned to proclaim the gospel wherever they go. You know, they set themselves up, they'll meet um, you know, Priscilla and Aquila when they used to live in Rome they set up their uh, a little church in their house. They met Paul in Corinth and then they went to Ephesus and Paul left in, in, in Ephesus and in Ephesus, they set up a house church. So movements of Christian people like that, you know, they're always concerned. They always want to see people being saved. They've always set up a little group wherever they are, you know, to study the gospel, study the Bible, read the Bible with people, get, get to know Jesus better, and, and so you'll be saved. So through the, the movements of Christian people like Priscilla and Aquila, uh, this is Acts um, 18, verses 1 to 4. Let me read it to you. After this, he left Athens, this is Paul, and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come uh, from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, Claudius was the emperor, a uh, Roman emperor at the time, uh, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Now, this is this is something recorded in history, in the history of the world. There was a time, AD 49, the year AD, AD 49, um, the, the emperor, the Roman emperor Claudius uh, commanded and, and says, ordered all the Jews to leave Rome because there was a, a conflict of some sort that was happening between the Jews and the, the non-Jews in Jerusalem. And so had to leave. And so Aquila and Priscilla, they were Jews, they had to leave and they came to Corinth and they met Paul there. And since they were of the same occupation, ten makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. So met them, they both had the same trade. They were making tents. So Paul, uh, as a minister and as a pastor, you know, the way he worked was that he proclaimed the gospel by day. He stayed up by night and he he, he, he set up tents. He, that's what he did. He, um, in order to get a living, see, they, they were tent makers. They make tents in order to make a living so that he can continue to proclaim the gospel. This is a this is the pattern of the New Testament. And, you know, I see people coming here overseas as ministers and, uh, you know, enjoying themselves and getting people to pay for. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the pattern of the New Testament is that ministers work uh, to get the money. Yes, of course, there may be gifts from the church, but they themselves are responsible for their uh, living expenses anyway. So the, in the moon, so they came to Corinth, uh, verses 18 to 19, tells us that after staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters in Corinth and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. 
Uh, he shaved his head at Sincrea uh, because of a vow he had taken. This is X18 versus uh, 18 to 19. And when they reached Ephesus, he left them there. So he left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus, uh, but he himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. So there you are. So he took them from Corinth, Priscilla and Aquila. So they moved. So you do these kind of movements also help with the expansion of the kingdom of God and the proclamation of the gospel of the gospel of the kingdom. And then in, in verses 24 to 26 of chapter 18 of Acts, uh, this is what we're told. After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters in Ephesus and sailed away to Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, sorry, that's uh, should be verses. Uh, that's the verse I read before. But here's verses 24. Uh, to 26. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was competent in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and been fervent in the spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he knew only John's baptism. So he probably only knew repentance, you know, um, encouraging people to repent. Uh, but he didn't know that the Holy Spirit has, been, has come and that it's the Holy Spirit who will work in people who turn them to God uh, and then to Jesus. So he began speaking boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. So this is these what I meant. Priscilla and Aquila and Ephesus, Paulus came from Alexandria. Alexandria is a city in Egypt known for its philosophical training. And he's here is Apollos, he's an eloquent man, he's good. he can speak very well, and he's explaining the gospel, but, but they saw that he's lacking a little bit. He doesn't know the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they set the to him side and um, explained the gospel to him. And then um, and then you know Apollos started going off with that gospel. See, movement of Christian people, wherever they go, they set themselves up, they help other speakers, they help see is them helping Apollos. Uh, and Apollos is a great speaker of the gospel. He went off and continued to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But also through God opening the hearts of people like Lydia and the Philippians, Chela. See, we're not alone in our proclamation of the gospel. We have God on our side. He can open the hearts of people. You see, we need to be sure about this and be confident about this. If some people, you know, some people are weird. They said that God cannot open our hearts. Why not? God created our hearts. God created us. He knows where to open our heart. He can open our heart. He can touch your heart and open your heart to him. And this is what he did with um, uh, uh, Lydia in Philippi. So Paul and uh, and his team, Silas and them, were in Philippi. And uh, this is what we're told. What happened in Philippi on the Sabbath day, uh, we went outside the city gate by the river. This is Acts 16, verses 13, 14. Uh, went uh, outside the city gate by the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the woman, to the women gathered there. A God fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple clothes in the city of Thyatira, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. See, the Lord opened her heart. Not only that, but also the Philippian jailer. Remember that night they were put in jail. And uh, they were singing hymns uh, in the middle of the night. You know, the, the jail was opened by by God, and the jailer thought that they, you know, the prisoners ran away. In those days, if you were a guard and prisoners ran away, your life would be taken uh, instead you know, uh, as a substitution for the prisoners that have run away from under your responsibility of care. But, uh, Paul and the prisoners ran away, so Paul had to. He wanted to kill himself, but Paul shouted out and said. No, and we're still here. And then see, this is what happened in, in Acts 16, verses 20, 29 to um, uh, 29 onwards. And the jailer called for light, rushed in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, along with everyone in his house. And he took them in the same hour of night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and his family were baptized. He brought them in his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he'd become to be he'd come to believe in God with his entire household. So whole household 
came. So now you have the, you have the church in Philippi, you have Lydia in his household, you have the jailer in his household, and then there is the you know, there was a girl that Paul uh, casted out uh, demons. I mean, so three people, three families, two families, and a girl. That's the church in Philippi. See, the church of the New Testament, we are just small churches, but Paul took them seriously. And they're very important because they are the churches of God uh, in a local context. So you know, through God opening people's heart, the heart of Lydia, the heart of the Philippian jailer and his family, God opened the heart of people so they receive the kingdom, they receive the Lordship of Jesus Christ and be saved. But also through the preaching of others like Apollos. We saw Apollos before. Uh, he was uh, evangelized, kind of corrected uh, in his gospel teaching by Priscilla and Aquila. And this is what we're told that happened afterwards. This is Acts 18, verses 27, 28. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, brothers and sisters wrote to the disciples to welcome him. After he arrived, he was of great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. He was vigorous in his demonstration, his speaking, his preaching about the gospel, and many people were encouraged through the preaching of um, gifted preachers. We, we can say that Apollos is a gifted preacher. He's a man who was gifted with the gift of speech, uh, so he was able to proclaim the gospel. And then lastly, lastly, it's through God's elect responding to the gospel. As I said before, you know, God can open the hearts of people but also God's elect, God elect his people. And when the elect hear his gospel, they will respond and turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. And that's exactly what happened when Paul was proclaiming the gospel uh, in a city called Antioch in Pisidia. Now, in the New Testament, there are two Antiochs. The Antioch in Syria was the sending church. That's the church of, the, of, uh, of St. Luke. Luke was a, a, a member of the church in Antioch. Barnabas and Paul uh, ministered in there for a year. We saw that before. They were the sending missionary church. They sent Paul and Barnabas in their mission. But, but uh, there was also a, um, a district called Pisidia uh, in, in, in near uh, Asia Minor, where it has Antioch as well. And, and this is Paul speaking there, and, and he was rejected by the Jews. But when the Gentiles, see, this is Acts 13, verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. So those are the many reasons where, uh, whereby the kingdom of God spread, basically through the proclamation of Jesus, the Spirit-filled proclamation of Jesus, through the Holy Spirit sending them out, through Jesus calling people like Paul from heaven, uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, opening people's heart to the gospel, and opening the heart of, uh, um, you know, of uh, of of um, the, the elect as well, but also through the movement of Christians, through the persecution of Christians, they move around and they move around with the gospel, and therefore they spread the gospel. It is something that we may learn. See, even the worship of the church, we saw that in Acts chapter two, just the godly worship of the church. Uh, you know, the growth of, of the spiritual growth of the church, the ministry of people, of them distributing uh, food to the needy and the ministry of the word. So many good reasons, so many encouraging reasons for us in the church today to grow, grow spiritually and grow numerically. So, Lord, help us. Help us to grow spiritually and to grow numerically in the church of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much. I presume that uh, now you are in a good position to be able to answer the question uh, for this lecture, which is, on what basis is the kingdom of God spreading to the ends of the earth? We've seen, I've summarized it at the end of the lecture. Thank you very much for listening. May God be with you.